Thank you everyone for joining here today uh, for this webinar. I will shortly introduce uh, the method life cycle assessment and give you an application uh, example in the chemical industry. A short introduction of who we are. Uh, so my name is Pieter Nachtegale. I um, work at the Sustainable Systems Engineering Group at Ghent University in Belgium. I work together with Professor Jo de Wolf and we have projects in very different applications being, for example, the chemical and the bio-based chemical industry, but also in the energy sector, raw materials, metals, etc. We are not just the two of us, just the two of us. We are quite a big group with a lot of different PhDs and postdocs. If we look at the chemical industry, it's a very important industry which influences the way we produce our food, the ways we travel, uh, the different the production of the clothes uh, we wear, and the different home appliances we use at home. But besides all these different benefits we get from the chemical industry, the industry is also scrutinized for its impact it has on the environment, being, for example, the emissions, uh, particularly CO2 emissions causing climate change, but also uh, plastic pollution and its effect it has on the environment. And therefore, as a sector, it's really important that we try to measure the sustainability, the environmental sustainability of our products and processes, but that we also try to improve it. And a very good method to measure the sustainability, the environmental sustainability of our products and processes is life cycle assessment. And what we do in life cycle assessment is that we try to compile the total inputs and outputs that happen throughout the life cycle of our product. So we look first at the raw material extraction, then we look at the production of our product itself. We look at how it is being transported. We look at how it is used and which, for example, energy is needed when using the product. And finally, we look at how it is being disposed, can be recycled, etc. Now, life cycle assessment is very much no longer something that is only done in academia and universities. No, it's really now a prominent tool used in industry to quantify environmental sustainability. It's used not only internally, but also for communication with, for example, customers uh, or to other businesses. And also at the policy level, uh, we see that it is being integrated already in 2003. The European Commission said that it is the best framework to assess the potential environmental impact of our products. And since that time, there have been many guidelines being developed in order to help people doing an LCA to follow the right guidelines. And most recently, we see that the European Commission is developing its product environmental footprint pilots, which are guidelines for specific sectors, for specific products, how you should apply an LCA. And currently, these pilots are being further de developed and implemented. So certainly something to look at if you want to do an LCA yourself. Now, why is it so important to use a life cycle approach? Well, let's just use a very clear example. Uh, let's say we want to compare electric mobility versus fuel-based mobility, something which is clearly very relevant if we look at the vote yesterday in the European Parliament. Now, if we only look at the use phase, so it's when you're driving your car, then it's quite clear that there is close to no emissions uh, for an electric car, while due to combustions, you have, of course, many emissions in the case of a fuel-based car. But is it fair to only look at the use phase? Because, of course, yeah, your car drives, your electric car uses electricity, and this electricity also needs to be produced. So it's important that we look how this electricity produced and which emissions take place during that production. Because, uh, as is clear from this example, emissions do not only happen during one life cycle phase, they can happen at every life cycle phase. So that's why it's so important to use a life cycle assessment approach when assessing the sustainability of our products. When we're doing an LCA, we can use the four-step framework as presented by the ISO guidelines. It exists out of four simple steps being goal and scope definition, inventory analysis, impact assessment, and interpretation. Of course, within this half an hour, I do not have the time to go in detail for all these different steps, but I will shortly explain them so you get the basics of every step. In the goal and scope definition, the first step is, of course, to define why you are doing your assessment. I'll give two examples. For example, it could be that you're trying to assess the sustainability of a t-shirt and you want to know where in its life cycle 
the highest environmental impact is taking place. Is it, for example, during fiber production, during the production of the um, of the T-shirt itself, or is it during the use phase or the disposal phase? Another possibility could be that you want to do a comparison. In that case, we're talking about a comparative assessment. For example, you could want to compare if it's better to use tap water compared to bottled water. Okay, in this case, the answer might be quite clear and you might not need to do a full life cycle assessment. But in other examples, for example, if you're having a traditional chemical process and you want to see if it's better to use an enzymatic process, doing such a comparative assessment can be very uh, interesting. Now, when you're defining your goal of your assessment, it's very important that you think about what is going to be your intended application. Uh, are you going to use this internally, for example, to find improvement opportunities, or do you want to use it to communicate to clients? So also there, your reasons for carrying out your study are very important. Is it really to improve the sustainability or is it for uh, commercial reasons that you're doing your study? Uh, then, of course, who is your intended audience? If it's an internal study, you might need to follow other uh, guidelines compared to when you want to communicate to customers. Because when you want to communicate, of course, you need to really follow the guidelines uh, accordingly and you might need to do an external review. Also, this is linked to, for example, if you want to do a comparative assessment, comparing your own product with a, a, uh, a competitor's product, then it's really important that you do this in a fair way. Secondly, we have to define the scope of our study. And the first aspect that we need to define is our functional unit. And our functional unit is basically a unit of measurements for which we're going to quantify our environmental impact. Let's go back to our two examples we gave before. In the case of a t-shirt, because our goal is to look at which life cycle steps have the highest impact, it could be okay to have a functional unit, simply one t-shirt. So you're going to determine the, the environmental impacts for producing one t-shirt and all the impacts throughout its life cycle. However, when we're doing a comparative assessment, for example, for our water example, yeah, we cannot use one bottle of water, for example, because yeah, tap water is coming out of the tap. You, cannot use, you don't buy it simply from a bottle. So here it's important to really think about the function of your product. And in this case, it's the consumption of water. So you can have as a functional unit, one liter of consumed water. Also for your t-shirt, uh, in case you would do a comparison, it might not be fair to have a functional unit such as one t-shirt. For example, if the durability of your t-shirts are different, you might need to use a functional unit such as wearing a t-shirt for one year, really thinking about the function of your product. Secondly, in our scope, we have to define our system boundaries. Where are we going to focus on? It could be that we're only interested at our own production. In that case, we can do a gate-to-gate -gate assessment. It's a little bit similar at looking your scope one emissions. It could also be interesting to look at your full supply chain. In that case, we're going to look at how our feedstocks are being produced, how the electricity is being produced, how its utilities are being produced, and so on. Thirdly, we can also take into account the, uh, the transport and use phase, and eventually the disposal and recycling of our product. In that case, we're doing a cradle to grave assessment. If we're really looking at it from a circular economy perspective, and we want to see how at the end of its life cycle, the product can again be used into a new life and into a new cycle, we can talk about cradle to grade. Cradle. Very often in the chemical industry, a cradle to gate assessment is done. Why? Because our products are often not the end product. They are often being used in very many different applications. And then it's really, for example, one kilogram of product, which is the most important as that eventually is going to have its function in many different other products. The second step of our life cycle assessment is by far the one that takes the most time, and it's the life cycle inventory stage. And in this stage, we're quantifying all different out inputs and outputs into our system. So here we see again our life cycle, and we're going to look at all the different inputs and outputs throughout our life cycle. The inputs could be, for example, our raw materials such as biomass, fossil fuels, and so on. But it is also energy such as electricity, um, natural gas, etc. Our outputs can be emissions such as CO2, or it can be the production of waste. These inputs and outputs need to be translated into what we call elementary resources and elementary emissions. Elementary resource can be, for example, water taken directly from nature, 
it could be minerals and so on. But elementary emissions are really your emissions to the natural environment. So, for example, CO2 into the air, certain nitrogen emissions into water, etc. To do this complete quantification, it requires a lot of data. And therefore, we have two different data sources. We have, or we have a, 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 a distinction between the two different types of data. We have what we call our foreground system and our foreground data and our background system and our background data. In our foreground system, this is really data that we collect ourselves, for example, by measurements in our chemical plant or by modeling. Uh, if, for example, if it's a new technology, we might need to do a modeling in a simulator such as Aspen. Um, while our background system, this is, for example, the, how the electricity is being produced, could be how our feedstocks are being produced. There, we do not quantify all these um, inputs and outputs ourselves, but we can rely on databases that already have this lifecycle inventory for these different inputs. A very known uh, database for lifecycle assessment is, for example, EcoInvent, but there are actually many other databases you can rely on. It's of course important that you use good data and some aspects that you need to consider when you're um, looking at your data is the first one, is your process representative? In case you're using database data, you will not always find exactly the, the, the input that you have uh, or, you, or are using within your plant, certainly not from the, the specific supplier that you are using. So you have to think, is the process, how it is being modeled in this database representative for the input that I'm using within my process. Secondly, is it temporarily representative? Certainly with new technologies, data from five years ago might already be outdated. So think about how much these processes have been changed throughout this time period. Is it spatially representative? If you're using data, if you're doing an assessment for your process here in Belgium, it might not be okay to use, for example, inputs that were uh, determined for uh, regions in the earth, uh, for example, in, in Malaysia or in the United States, because a completely different energy mix is being used there because uh, water consumption is not as uh, dire depending on which region of the world you are in. Is a production scale representative? Certainly with new technologies, you might be developing a technology on pilot scale or on lab scale. And then if you're using this data directly into a life cycle assessment and comparing it to industrial data for another process, then this comparison may not be fair. And in that case, you might need to consider upscaling effects to go from your pilot scale data to industrial scale data. And finally, of course, is your source reliable? When you're looking at in LCA studies and literature, for example, you need to consider why is this study done? Why is it using the certain methodologies in order to uh, know if it is, is a reliable source or not. In the third step, we're doing our actual impact assessment. So we have all these inputs and outputs, but now we have to quantify how this has an influence on our environment. And for this, you need to do cause effect chain modeling. Now, we don't need to do this ourselves. We can use the models that have already been developed by many different organizations. But let's see example, for example, how this goes. And for example, for climate change. On the left, we see our emissions to the environment, for example, CO2, N2O, and so on. And this results into a certain radiative forcing in the atmosphere, which will result in an increase of the global mean temperature. This, in the end, will result in many more extreme events, higher temperatures, etc., which eventually will impact our human health and our ec ecosystems. When we're using these types of indicators, which are, for example, an increase of temperature, an increase of radiative forcing, we talk about midpoint indicators. If we're really quantifying all the way to the effect on human health or on ecosystem quality, we talk about endpoint indicators. There is not only climate change. Just as many say, there's not only CO2, there's also other impacts that we have on the environment. So these different elementary resources, elementary emissions, these are, so this is coming from our data inventory or different inputs and outputs have an effect on many different indicators also besides climate change such as eutrophication land use ecotoxicity and so on and these all can have an effect on human health health ecosystem quality or on the depletion of natural resources the fourth and final step is our interpretation of course the first thing we have to do is to look if we answered the goal of our study if we did not do so, 
LCA is generally an iterative process. So we learn from our first cycle and then go and improve the data quality, for example, in order to go towards a better assessment. Some things to consider during the stage is, is which limitations, which choices, which assumptions did I have to make? And do these assumptions allow me to fairly answer the goal of my study? Some tools we can apply that can help here are sensitivity analysis and uncertainty assessment. Of course, when we have so much data, there will be uncertainty related to the study. So it's quite important to always do an uncertainty assessment to know whether your results are reliable to answer the goal. The sensitivity analysis can be good to know if certain limitations of your study are fair. And by looking at the effect of these limitations on uh, the outcome of our study. OK, a short summary of LCA before we go and dive into an example. As some strengths are, it's a, very, it's a data based method. It has a strong scientific basis uh, and it considers the full life cycle. So we avoid that we shift the burden from one life cycle stage, for example, production towards an other life cycle stage, such, for example, uh, the raw material extraction. There is also the fact that it highlights trade offs between different impact categories. Uh, for example, we might reduce our impact on climate change, but maybe we're improving or increasing better our impact on uh, other indicators. Because this method has been quite uh, robust for many years, that there are many methods that we can apply, um, which is also an advantage. Finally, some limitations. Yeah, you need a lot of data, so you cannot do this an LCA or a qualitative LCA in a short period. You need time and you need people in order to collect this data. Another disadvantage you could say is that because you have these trade-offs, it might not always give you a clear answer on which is the most uh, environmentally sound option. And finally, it's a challenge to include changes over time within life cycle assessment. If we know that there's a certain changes that will happen over time, it's quite challenging to include this uh, dynamic aspect into LCA. All right, this was quite quickly. I hope you can still follow life cycle assessment and its four steps. But now I will give an example so it becomes more clear how this can be useful within your own uh, production. And for this uh, example, I will use the example of producing propylene glycol from a renewables-based resource. If you have vegetable oils and animal fats, they are often used uh, for the production of, for example, fatty acids and biofuels. And as a side product, you have glycerol. And this glycerol can be, via hydrogenolysis, be converted into propylene glycol, which has many different applications, such as the icing, etc. Now, this propylene glycol, it's an important product that is generally produced petrochemically. Still, over 98%, I think, today is produced petrochemically. However, since a couple of years, we can produce it also from this renewable resource being glycerol sourced from vegetable oils and animal fats. In this study, we want to do a comparison between the environmental sustainability of the petrochemical route and the oleochemical route and the biodiesel route. So what was the goal and scope for this study? Well, we're doing both a contribution assessment because we wanted to know where are the impacts throughout the life cycle uh, chain. But we're also doing a comparative assessment, being these three possible production routes for propylene glycol. Because propylene glycol is in itself not the final product, it is being used for many different applications. We chose the functional unit of one ton PG at the production gate, so at the production of our facility. For our system boundaries, because of that reason, we, we chose a cradle-to-gate assessment. Which indicators did we look at? Well, it's always important to look both at a resource-based indicator and at emissions-based indicators. And in this case, for the resource-based indicators, we looked at the cumulative exergy extracted from the natural environment. That's quite complex, and I don't have the time to explain that now, but basically it quantifies the total amount of resources you use from the environment. And secondly, we used the emissions-based indicators as recommended by the ILCD. Here you see the results for the many different indicators that we, um, that we assessed. Let's first look at climate change, which is the second emissions-based indicator shown. We can see 
that uh, the petrochemical route scores the worst, has the highest impact for this indicator. If we switch to the oleochemical or the uh, biodiesel route, we can reduce our impact by 40 to 50 percent, uh, depending uh, on the oleochemical route or the biodiesel route. It's quite important that uh, to state here whether we account for carbon storage or not. Carbon storage, because we're using a renewable based route, this means that the CO2 that is within our product is being taken up from the atmosphere and is being stored within the product. Eventually, of course, at the end, the CO2 will again be emitted. Therefore, it's important to show both the uh, results with and without carbon storage within our uh, results. If we look at other indicators, such as, for example, marine eutrophication, terrestrial eutrophication, land use, we see that actually the oleochemical route and the biodiesel route have a much higher impact compared to the petrochemical route. And this is, of course, because of the agricultural step that is needed to produce our vegetable oils and animal fats. Therefore, this trade-off, it's of course important and interesting from such a result that we are aware of this trade-off so that we can also look at how we can tackle these environmental impacts we have in different life cycle stages. So in the next step, we looked at the contribution analysis, and this is now specifically for the climate change impact. And we can see that a very large share for our oleochemical route and our biodiesel route being B and C is related to the production of the feedstock being vegetable oils and animal fats. Secondly, we have a very high impact related to fractionation and purification. And this is because these are steps that have a very high energy consumption. They require a lot of steam and therefore this energy relates into a high climate change impact. So we gave two recommendations for improvements. The first one is to use only ISCC certified vegetable oils, which means that they are certified for sustainability. For example, avoid the, avoiding uh, deforestation. The second improvement is to switch from standard steam production in boilers towards a combined heat and power system. We can then look at how these optimizations improved our climate change impact. And we can really see that, there, that both the, the combined heat and power steam and the ISCC palm oil has a big reduction in our environmental impact, specifically our climate change impact. So we can see that both on-site and off-site within being within our supply chain improvements can have an impact on our um, on our environmental sustainability. So some conclusions specifically for this study was that we can decrease the emitted CO2 by switching from the petrochemical chemical to a renewable based route being oleochemical or biodiesel PG. However, we should be aware that the shift of burden can take place to the agricultural related indicators. And combining both on-site improvements and sustainable supply chain allows further reducing our impact. This was just a short introduction, of course, to LCA. We only had half an hour, but we are preparing a massive open online course on life cycle assessment, which will dive much deeper into how life cycle assessment is being used within the chemical industry and how it can be good to apply it to your processes and products. So if you're interested, it will be launched somewhere in the upcoming months. And we will send um, a link to all the people registered to do this webinar so you can follow this MOOC for free if you're interested. All right, let's, fi let's finalize with some concluding remarks. We learned that it's really important to look at the full life cycle of our product or system instead of looking only at our facility or our process. We know that it's a, now a prominent and well-developed tool with many different guidelines available. Of course, you always have to be very careful when interpreting your results, knowing which assumptions you have made. Also, when you're reading, for example, other LCA studies, why was the study done? Which assumptions were made? It's important to always uh, know this carefully. And finally, we have seen with the example that it's a powerful tool to assess the sustainability of our processes and products, but also to steer optimization opportunities within our industry. There you go. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them now.